when I was at Bible College, I started drinking coffee. And I had one coffee a day every, every few days, and that, that was well and truly enough for me. And so after having a, a few coffees each week, Catherine and I thought, oh, it might be a good idea to buy a, a pod machine of our own. Nice and easy to make a coffee, and we were happy with that. And so we just bought the same sort of pod machine as what they use at college, so we didn't have to learn anything new. But as the years have gone on, uh, coffee drinking has increased. Catherine and I have started drinking coffee a day, and... My one coffee is gone sometimes into two coffees a day, and so we thought it might be good to invest in a, a better coffee machine, especially now while we're stuck at home. And so we thought, well, this is an important decision. It's going to cost a bit of money uh, for us to do. So what do you do when you're going to spend a bit more money? You do your research. Uh, you want to know the facts so you can make an informed decision. And so that's what we did. I, I, I looked at online what a coffee mean machine should do. I read different reviews on uh, comparing different models. And the more research you do, the more confident you feel about the decision that you come to. And Catherine and I are now proud owners of, of a new coffee machine. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, making you a coffee when you're eventually able to come over and be in our house again. See, when decisions are to be made, it's good to know the facts. And so, uh, this week, next week, uh, these sermons on eldership are to give you the knowledge to make biblically informed decisions. Whether or not to an elect an elder is a big decision. And so, rightly, we should pray and put time into our decisions. And so that's what we're going to do over the next two Sunday mornings. We're going to listen to what the Bible says about church and eldership. This is not only for those who, who might become elders, but for all of us and all members so that we can understand how to best support and encourage our elders in their role as well. Next week we're going to work through the big questions of who should be elders, what kind of person are we looking for, and what qualities uh, should they have and display. But today, we'll look at what an elder is. Yeah. and why we have them. Uh, starting with a, a look at how our churches are governed. We come from different church backgrounds uh, here at Hume PC. So I think it's important for us to understand what we as Presbyterians do. And I actually believe uh, what we do is biblical. Uh, we, Prezies, we do have our issues, that's for sure. But something I think we, at least in theory, get pretty right is, is this. Uh, different denominations have different governmental structures under Christ. But to put it simply, there are uh, three broad groups. Episcopalian, uh, Congregationalist, and Presbyterian. Uh, Episcopalian churches, such as Anglican churches, they're structured so that they have one person who is in charge of the congregation. Uh, usually that's called a rector or a priest or presbyter or minister. And above them is one person called a bishop, who then oversees many rectors and, and congregations. And above the bishop is one person called a, an archbishop and, and so on. The point is that Episcopalian churches, uh, in them, the local church is governed by one person at the top. A congregationalist churches such as Baptists and Pentecostals, they're like the complete opposite. They're not governed by one person, but, but by the whole congregation themselves. Traditionally, there is no ruling body over them. Uh, each member in the church has an equal say. So congregational meetings are made up of all members in the church and they decide what happens in all matters in the church. So congregational churches are governed by the congregation. Presbyterian churches, 
on the other hand, such as the Reformed Church and, and obviously Presbyterian churches, are not governed by one, and not governed by the whole, but they're governed by a group of elders, selected by the congregation. Uh, in the Greek, the word for translated elder is presbyteros, uh, from which we get Presbyterian and presbytery. So in Presbyterian churches, govern, they're governed uh, by local elders over the congregation. Uh, and then above them is a, a bigger group of representatives, elders, called the presbytery. And over the presbytery is an even bigger group of re representative elders called the, the general, general assembly, and so on. So put it simply, Episcopalian churches are governed by one. Congregational churches are governed by all. And Presbyterian churches are governed by some, namely elders. But you may be wondering, well, why the Presbyterian churches chooses to govern themselves through a group of elders? Well, I think there are three basic reasons with the first being uh, the most important. Firstly, the scriptures. We govern through a group of elders primarily because this is the example given to us in the scriptures. And when the Apostle Paul was on his first missionary journey throughout Asia Minor, he spent time establishing and encouraging churches through his uh, preaching of the gospel and the work of God's Spirit, graciously, many people were becoming Christians. And so one of Paul's chief concerns was, well, who's going to care for God's people when he left to go on then plant the next church? So interestingly, he doesn't say, oh, just run yourselves, it'll all be fine. Instead, we read in, in Acts 14, verse 23, it says that Paul and Barnabas appointed elders, for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord, in whom they had put their trust. In every church, Paul was wanting to establish elders to, to care for, to govern those who had mercifully bought, been brought into God's kingdom. But not only did Paul establish elders himself, but he even sent out others, people, to, to do the work across other churches too. Paul writes to Titus, Titus 1.5, he says, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished, and that was to appoint elders in every town, as I directed you. See, one of Titus' main job was to appoint elders in every town. That is, to appoint elders in every church. And not just an elder singular, but elders, plural. And this is a, a constant pattern that we see in the first century churches. And so much so that one commentator has said, the plurality of elders, that is elders, plural, is seen in virtually every known church in the New Testament and is spoken of by virtually every New Testament writer who writes about church leadership. Ultimately, we have elders because the New Testament has elders. The second reason why we have elders, plural, is a theological argument based on a plural God. One of the distinctives of Christianity is that we worship one God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, known as the Trinity. Not, not three gods, but one God in three persons. God is plural. The three persons in the Godhead are, are in relationship with each other. They work together. God is about community and relationships. And consequently, God's people are to reflect God. And when God created Adam, he didn't get him to do all the work by himself. He created Eve also, so they could work together. When Jesus sends out his disciples, he doesn't send them out by themselves. He sends them out two by two to, to work together. The Apostle Paul, he had 81 different fellow workers that are recorded in the New Testament. For what purpose? To work together. So there's no 
theological principle here, well, the theological principle is that there is to be no lone rangers, but people working together. And a plurality of elders is consistent with this. But thirdly, having a, a plurality of elders is a practical choice too. For example, it, avoid, it avoids a church being too greatly affected by the quirks or the personality or the sin of just one person. There is much more a healthy diversity by having a team. Having, having a group of elders also promotes this transparency and accountability uh, within the leadership. Because each elder has other elders to keep them accountable. And also allows the elders to draw on a, a wider pool of wisdom to make decisions, but still have this group that's small enough to actually make decisions. Not get into the too many cooks spoil the broth sort of type of situation. But even more simply, it allows the leaders to share the work of doing this a very difficult job that elders are required to do. And so what is that job? What is the elder's role? The basic role of an elder first comes from the titles that the Bible uses to speak about local church leaders. And get a bit technical, there are three Greek words which designate those who hold this office that we call elders uh, in the church. And you see them there on the screen and in the outlines. Uh, Presbyteros, Epikopos, and Poimen. Firstly, Presbyteros. We, we, we saw earlier that this word, Presbyteros, is normally translated as elder or presbyter. It is used in a, a few different ways. Sometimes to refer the great forefathers of the church sometimes simply to refer to older men, but as here we will look at it, where it is used to speak in terms of church leaders, who are specifically chosen for this role. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 17, Paul refers to the elders as the ones who direct the affairs of the church. That is, those who have the responsibility to, to rule, lead, but also care for those in the local church. So depending on your church background, I know we have quite a range, you might have some leaders that sort of sort of said, it's my way or the highway. But the Bible actually never really speaks in any sense of that this is the way that elders should rule. Elders actually are never told to lord it over the congregations. Instead, they are to serve them by leading in love. This might mean that there's hard decisions to be made, but they're always to be made in love. Although the word elder sounds like only old people can really apply for this sort of job, it's much broader than just seniors. Age can be helpful. I mean, age is... You have the gained life experience and wisdom. But elders are not chosen primarily on age. Remember Paul, he instructs Timothy, a young man in 1 Timothy 4.12. He says, do not let anyone look down on you because you're young. He says, so set an example for the believers. So an example in speech, conduct, in love, in faith and in purity. And so it's not a matter of age, but of character, of conviction and conduct, uh, which we'll look more at next Sunday. And also next week we'll look at whether it should be a matter, matter of gender as well. In the word that, in the end, that the word presbyteros in reference to church elders is all about leading in love. And the second title used to describe that this role, episcopos, is usually translated as bishop or overseer. 
and probably no surprise that the title Episcopos is where the Episcopalians get their name, since they designate themselves as overseen by bishops that they consider different to the elders. And so we read in, in Titus 1, 7 that as an overseer is someone who manages God's household. So this translated sometimes as God's steward or God's administrator. They are the ones chosen by God to be the managers of the church. That is God's household, God's family. And Paul, he makes this familiar role clear in 1 Timothy 3.5 when he speaks at about the overseas, saying, if anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he then take care of God's church? See, the wider church and the, the local church is in mind, and they're, they're just be seen as family. And Ten years ago, I was travelling with Catherine, my wife, and our then uh, 15-month-old son, Joshua, and we were travelling and we were in London, on the other side of the world from our home, away from our church, and we were feeling a bit disconnected. And we, we visited a church on a Sunday night. And from the moment we entered the church, we were welcomed. They helped us to know what was going on, we were loved, we were offered dinner. And it just felt like we were home. I never met any of these people before, but that's the power of... Christian fellowship, the Christian family. And many of you, I'm sure, have experienced this great privilege of being a a member of Christ's worldwide family. That anywhere in the world, you'll meet fellow family members who you already have this deep connection with because of Jesus. But it's even better when we're in this local church Every day, we are a, we are a church family. You here are my, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And in God's grace, he, he raises up overseers to, to care for us and to manage us as God's household. And so in the end, just like Presbyteros, Episcopos is also about leading in love. And so the third title, Poiman, is the one that ties these two together. Appointment is usually translated as pastor or shepherd. In most churches, this is usually seen as a a specific role in a church that that one person holds, that they are the, the pastor or the minister or the reverend. In the Presbyterian churches, technically though, we only have elders. But they're sort of split into these two groups, the the teaching elders and and the ruling elders. So teaching elders, like me, are the primary preachers and teachers. And are also the ones who have the responsibility to administer the sacraments like the baptism and the Lord's Supper. Teaching elders have a slightly different role to the ruling elders. Usually because they've had more theological training and usually paid to work full-time and are are working full-time. And so they are usually called the minister, as that's what more people understand what that title is. But in the end, we are simply equals with each other as leaders of the congregation. So in meetings, each elder votes and each is counted for one. The, The teaching elder... Uh, are normally seen as the pastor and shepherds, but in church, in terms of church leadership of the, the congregation, all the elders, all of them are pastors and shepherds. And so this is how the early church saw the, this role. The church is led by the elders, all of them who are the overseers, who are the shepherds. So these uh, three roles or titles that we've seen are are closely tied together. So much so that they're used interchangeably. We saw in our first reading this morning in Acts 20, Paul sent out for the elders of the church in Ephesus and he said to these elders, he says, verse 28, he said, Keep watch over 
yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which is brought by his own blood. All three roles are sort of tied together. So the elders are to oversee and to shepherd the people that they've been given pastoral responsibility for. And that is the local church. So what does this shepherding look like? Well, Peter explains it in in our second reading today, on 1 Peter 5. He says the elders are to be, he said, verse 2, they're to be shepherds of God's flock. That is, under your care, watching over them. Not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So his shepherd is to be willingly watching over the flock. In the first century, and still in parts of Israel today, shepherds lived among their flocks, watching over them 24-7. And likewise, an elder is to live amongst their sheep. And to, to care for them. See, elders aren't to live in this ivory tower, but, but on the ground with the rest of the sheep, to, to watch over them, to protect them. Also here, we see the shepherds' work isn't to be self-centred. It's not for what they can gain, but it's actually focused on the good of the sheep. And that's what is love, isn't it? Love, by definition, is other person-centred. The elders are to be people characterised by love. Ones who demonstrate this love to, to the sheep under their care. And thirdly here we see the shepherds, they, they don't lord it over the sheep, do they? But they serve as examples for the sheep. So likewise, elders are to live exemplary lives. Through their lives they are to show what love and care and compassion, leadership and responsibility looks like. So elders are to be shepherds of God's flock. Like the elders, appointment is all about leading in love. I mean, you might take exception to be being called a sheep. Probably doesn't bring the most positive images to mind, does it? And especially, you might take exception that some are called shepherds and others are called sheep. But in reality, we are all sheep, aren't we? Even the elders who are the shepherds of God's local church are better called under-shepherds because they still have a shepherd above them too. Like we saw in the last couple of weeks in in John 10, all believers are ultimately under the good shepherd, aren't we? Jesus Christ. We are all like sheep. Sometimes we act just like sheep too, don't we? A bit dumb and a bit rebellious. Actually, 1 Peter 2 tells us that we have all been like sheep that have gone astray. Still, the Good Shepherd loves and protects and leads and teaches and guides us anyway. And he does so very powerful. Remember in John 10, 11, Jesus said, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus is the one who comes and shows us Amongst other things, that how an elder should love his congregation. He is to give himself for the people who loves him. But for, give himself for his people whom he loves. Now that's, that's a big task, isn't it? He was thinking, well, maybe yeah, one day I'd, I'd like to become an elder. Let me hit you how serious this role is. An elder is a shepherd of the flock God has given to him. So all prospective elders need to take this call seriously. Jesus is your model. Being an elder is a big calling. So then, what is an elder? Why do we have them? An elder is simply an, an under-shepherd of Christ. An overseer of the people that God has given them to lead in love. 
And we have elders because this is an example we have been given from the scriptures, which reflects the nature of God. And it's also the, the most practical system for leading the church in love. The, the role of an elder is a high calling with a high responsibility. So please, let, let's be praying for our current elders. Knowing, uh, knowing them and knowing all of what we've been speaking of, but just as the, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 13, he says, have confidence in your leaders. Submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, he says, not a burden. For that will be a benefit of you. Hebrews 13, 17. I mean, we as Hume would love to see our eldership team grow. So let's pray for that. And let's also ask God to raise up more elders, more shepherds and more overseers for his flock. For his glory alone. So let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, the good shepherd. He loves and cares for his flock. Thank you that you in your wisdom have given us under shepherds, elders within our church, that you have put over us to shepherd us, to lead us, and even discipline us when we need it. Lord, please help us to turn to the elders that you've given us in, in times when we need it. Help us to submit to them. Help our leaders here, our elders, to look to Jesus as their example, to shepherd the flock that you have given them. Help our leaders to serve in love and to set examples for all of us. Lord, please keep them from sin. Help them to live exemplary lives. And Lord, we ask that you will raise up more elders. Please be with us now in the, the coming weeks as we work through at Hume our election process. May we be a prayerful church in this, and may we be seeking your wisdom. May we be wise as we read your words in the Bible about elders. So please be with us all, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.